Hey everybody, I'm here with my good friend, Rich Levy. Rich has been on the channel before, I think a couple times, but we can't remember when. I think it's when Ghosts in the Machine came out <laughs> that we did a review of the record. It's been a while. Uh, Rich works for Live Nation. I think I have to say that up front. And he's the one that convinced me to do the live shows. I'm still mad at him for it, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. Rich, welcome. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh... It's so funny. So I'm not here in any official capacity with no. Live Nation. I, I want to remain employed. Okay, wait, I have to just say this. So one of the things about my channel is that my channel is basically the discussions that w we used to have when I lived with Rich when I first moved here and there was a house of five musicians and we'd sit around pre-internet watching MTV and we would have the exact discussions that I have on here Kind of like the one we're going to have today. Okay, go ahead, Rich. Yeah, it would be Sunday nights, X-Files, then, you know, story time with Rick. Sure. Right. Yeah, okay, was, so. Yeah. All right, so uh, huge fan of the channel. I watch probably one in every 20 videos. And <laughs> I, I, wa I caught the, the uh, Super Bowl Usher one because I was interested in what you had to say about it, especially because it was Atlanta-centric. With, with the lineup, and also uh, because it was short, eight minute video, I was right. like, this is in my wheelhouse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm watching the video and I get about six minutes into it and you're talking about acts that can play the Super Bowl and how, and you sort of read back the list of Super Bowl performers back to the- 2013. 2013. And you start talking about how hard it is to become a global superstar in today's environment with the algorithms, et cetera. And I got some really interesting takes on that because I'm watching um, the globalization of music in a whole different way. Okay, so give me your thoughts. So I think that there's this crazy thing going on where there's the breakdown of monoculture. You and I are old enough to have lived through the pre-MTV era, the MTV era, and to some extent the post-MTV era, and now the, the internet era, early internet era, and now the social media and streaming era, right? Like really- I like, I like that way that you broke those down. Radic radically different. Yeah. And I work in, at Live Nation where we do tours. We still see so many tour, tours of artists from the 70s and 80s that are gigantic, gigantic ticket sellers and around the world. And then we see music that's been developing since then. For so many years, we get asked, what's going to happen when the Rolling Stones no longer tour? What's gonna to happen? Is there a next generation? And the challenging answer from everybody is always, well, the, we don't see the future. And not, not our answer, but usually the interviewer or this news source saying, we don't see the future. And then slowly but surely, the future emerges, whether that is, you know, Pearl Jam and Dave Matthews band, you know, becoming arena and, and stadium acts or Foo Fighters after them or Blink-182 or Green Day or Taylor Swift or Beyonce or The Weeknd, who you mentioned played, played one of the, uh, the Super Bowl halftime shows. Yeah. It's just so different because you don't have that global monoculture where if something got on MTV, it was known everywhere by everyone all of a sudden because Something got on MTV, every radio station played it, every supermarket had it. Now, like, there's not that. Like, I don't even know where you hear music anymore. That's a huge thing. When you said that to me, I, I thought to myself, wow, that's true. Because the listening experience, I went into the mall with uh, Layla and we were in some store and something came on and I had her Shazam it because I didn't know what it was. And I didn't recognize the artist even when she Shazam Shazam Shazammed it. That's hard to say. And then another one came on. It was some playlist and I'm finding all these different artists. And of course I couldn't do it on my phone. So I had to take a picture of her phone with Shazam on it. But these are things that you wouldn't hear on the radio and it just happened to be this, whatever playlist they were playing in the store. And I asked the people and they didn't know. Do you not have Shazam on your phone? I have Shazam on my phone, but it doesn't work on my phone for some reason. Makes sense. I don't know why it doesn't. It did. I got an iPhone 15 because my phone broke and uh, and it doesn't for some reason. Shazam does not work on it. Interesting. What did you say about Apple? Okay. So, anywho, back to topic. But you could not avoid the songs, is what you said. Yeah, and there was a time when you couldn't avoid the songs. I you know, I remember going to the beach in the early 80s. I'm like whatever, a preteen teenager, and 
walking down the beach and you could almost hop from, from beach radio to beach radio hearing Rosanna by Toto. It was unavoidable. Right. And Toto can still tour. You've had Luke on your channel. I mean, they, they still go out there and people love those songs. Now, here's the thing. Monoculture is, is not the same thing anymore. We're not all listening to the same thing. Explain things. monoculture for people that are watching this. Like, I don't even know what they're talking about with okay. monoculture. You know, that's, that's, that's fair. So the, first of all, credit where credit's due. Bob Lefsetz, whose podcast you're on, writes about this all the time. And a lot of my thinking and jumping off on this comes from following, following what he's had to say. Monoculture is when it was much easier in the media environment for a single song to become pervasive throughout the world and global culture. And that's easier to do when there are three television channels and five radio stations and then 11 te television channels and then maybe even 40 with the, the first introduction of cable. But now it's endless. And it was endless even before we were where we are in, in terms of internet and social media. Think about when satellite radio came on with 200 channels. I mean, it, it just, it, it's unbelievable how stratified the media environment is now. Not even talking about how people can, you were talking about how algorithms serve people more of what they already like. So it's much harder for them to even encounter Right, because they get, they get siloed is the term I used in, into a certain genre. If you like that, you're going to like this. If you like that, you like this. It's like everything is similar to each yeah, other. Yeah, it's, it's horrible. Like if you went and started watching uh what makes the song great videos, you might get served more of them until there was nothing in your feed but <laughs> that. <laughs> Although I did all different genres of music. That, that is fair. So monoculture is when there was a single culture, there could be a single list of songs that everyone would know. And even if you didn't follow the genre, right? Yep. Like maybe you aren't a country fan and you didn't know what was going on in country, but there were still things that would get so big they would break into public consciousness in other ways. And at the same time today, let's say that you are walking through the grocery store and they happen to be playing music. What music are they playing? Are they playing anything current? And are you listening? Are you on a phone call? Are you listening are you to listening, a podcast? Are you listening with earbuds? Are you, do you have There's earbuds? There's a lot of people in? just at you walk around, you see people with earbuds in all the time listening to their own music in their own world. That's exactly right. So the chances for those shared experiences of, of music discovery are, are just incredibly different now. So you have this, this stratification um, where people are getting deeper and deeper into smaller silos. And, you know, a lot of people say that, that artists aren't as big, music isn't as big uh, since the monoculture broke down. Now, that was where I diverge from, from what you were having to say, because I agree that not everybody knows all the same stuff. But the misconception is that music was bigger and music artists were bigger in the 80s and 90s versus today. In some ways they were in that everybody knew them and we had a shared vocabulary of what was popular. But things that are big today are so much bigger than they were then. Give an example. Journey on the Escape or Frontiers tour might have gone out and played one or two stadium dates in a row. Uh, I haven't gone back to check the past routing, so don't hold me to it, but big acts of the era, they would play a stadium, maybe two stadiums in a marketplace. Today, Coldplay will play six stadiums in a single city, six stadiums in, in a single city. Taylor Swift, will do four to five stadiums in a single city and will stop, not because there's not demand, but because she just doesn't want to do more shows in that city because she wants to make it elsewhere in the world or in the country or, or wherever else it may be. So you have this crazy dissonance of music being bigger than it's ever been, and yet artists also not having the same level of penetration that they've had. So how is that possible? Wait, wait, wait. Let me let me just go back. In 1992, U2, I saw at Veterans Stadium, the second night of a stadium tour. Now, they would never really do more than two nights on a tour, but could they have done more than two nights at, at Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia? Uh, the answer is there's no way to, to know. And yeah. there are plenty of people that I work with who were the people doing those shows in the era, and they would be able to give real answers to that. Anything I would say would be speculative, but nobody did it. 
And that suggests that, that there was some level of trepidation around doing it. Now, that could have been trepidation around doing it because the singer didn't want to do another night because, because of voice. It could have been because there were other places they wanted to get to and there was a limited amount of time. Rewinding for a second, people don't remember that pre-internet, like releases were so different. You talked about how there was a run-up in press and publicity months ahead and then a single and then eventually the album came out. Well, that would be in A territory. It might be a three to six month lead up for the U.S. And then if the artist was not available to go over to other countries and do press and tour and radio, it might never be released there. It's, why, right. it's why we grew up on things that were called imports where you had to actually bring physical records or CDs in from other countries because they weren't released in your country. Right, just because you had a release here didn't mean you were guaranteed to be released in Europe. That's exactly right. Or, or anywhere else in the world beyond that, if you can think about it. So now we fast forward to where we are today uh, with an internet experience where there are no barriers to distribution. There's immediate distribution worldwide. There are no barriers to promotion you can reach people, fans can, bands can reach people, artists can reach people directly in ways they never could have before. They, there was no way in 1970 or 1980 or 1990 to directly reach your fans. You could not just put out a blast on social media. You would have to do an interview in a print publication or go on a nightly talk show. And even then, you were just hoping your fans would tune in. Now there's direct communication. Now gaining people's attention that's, that's a different problem, right? Right. But what's happened now is artists are bigger and smaller than they've ever been. Wow. Okay. So S -s explain that. Because music is immediately released and distributed everywhere without barrier, there is more demand around the world for artists than there's ever been before. Once again, I try not to talk too much for my Live Nation hat because I, this is not a sanctioned interview. I didn't ask, so they probably would have said fine. <laughs> but, you know, there are, there's more demand for acts that break through to play in the world than the acts have time to do. Taylor Swift could stop making records and go on tour for four years straight and still never fill the demand around the world. She never really worked Europe. How many records has she done? 10? Oh, like yeah. she, like she was that. a country artist. They don't generally go to Europe. She went over there as a stadium artist, right. which is kind of unfathomable to people who came up in the before time. Additionally, there is a globalization of music we've never seen before. Bad Bunny is a gigantic global superstar who doesn't sing in English. Right. That was never even a hint of a possibility in a pre-internet era. It was the, the Hollywood paradigm where either it was a U.S. export or it was a London export, and that's what was popular Or around it was a band uh, from Sweden that sang in English. Like that, a that's ABBA. fair. Or there, I mean, look, I don't mean to discount Bollywood or things that were, were specific to specific countries, but... But it, there was very little. The English-speaking... Other than in Sweden, and uh, you'd have the UK and and uh, and the US, Australia, and Canada, and then occasionally acts would break through that were singing in English that were outside from outside of those countries. That's right. So now all of a sudden, not every act is generated out of the US. US acts can tour places they've never been able to tour before, India, Israel, etc. Um, and acts from all of those places can come and tour places, cities in the U.S. that would have never been imaginable before. Acts might be able to come over and do New York and L.A. and Chicago. Now we're seeing, you know, foreign artists come in and do 8, 10, 20 cities in arenas and be able to do that kind of sellout business. So once again, bigger and smaller than it's ever been before all at the same time. Which brings me back to the original thought starter of... Yep. The Super Bowl. The Super Bowl. Who right. can play the Super Bowl? The Super Bowl's like, what, 100 to 125 million people watching. Yes. I think the answer to that is that there are plenty of artists, just like the answer to that question, who's going to replace the, the classic rock artists when they stop? Who is going to replace the Super Bowl artists? And the answer is there are plenty of artists who will play the Super Bowl going forward. 
as the audience continues to age up and as those, those artists find their, their way generationally. I read a, a story yesterday that Imagine Dragons mm -hmm. has 10 songs that have passed a billion plays each on Spotify. It's amazing. Amazing. Additionally, yeah. some of those songs have a billion plus separate plays on YouTube. Yeah. Now, understanding that not everybody is an Imagine Dragons fan, not everybody knows who Imagine Dragons is. Right. But there will be a point down the road, I'm not sure where the tipping point is, where enough people globally no know them, Dragons know them that, the they, that they can play the Super Bowl. That's, that's exactly right. <laughs> you're, uh, uh, Mr. Reynolds, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> well, I would love to know your thoughts on this topic. Rich, thanks so much for being here. Hey, one more thing. I love you, buddy. You too, my Keep friend. Keep doing your thing. Thanks.